Yo, where Cats at? Cats was the best movie of 2019. Cats got snow. Are you an everyday nerd? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so that you don't miss the next episode. Yo, welcome back to your Everyday Nerd. I'm your host, Zach Snyder. If you're new around here on Yin, we pull from every corner of nerd culture to talk about anything and everything that piques my interest. A couple months ago, the 2020 Oscars happened, and for the past three years, I've taken on the task to watch and review every film nominated for the biggest Academy Award, The Best Picture. This year, I've also been working my way through every single thing that got a nominee. So I'll be doing another video where I rank all 53 films and shorts that were nominated this year. That was a mistake. But first, we've already looked at and reviewed all nine of the Best Picture nominees this year in their own individual videos. Go check those out if you haven't already. And today, we're going to stack them up against together to see which one is the best of the best and rank them from worst to best. This has been my favorite year so far of these Best Picture marathons, so it was tough to actually rank all of these, but let's do it. The Best Picture nominees of 2020. Number 9, Joker. Directed by Todd Phillips, 11 nominations, 2 wins. It's Joker. Next. Okay, so Joker is a loose adaptation of the comic book villain by the same name. And while I love the concept here, giving a name and a background to a character that has never really had one, it just so happens that this is the only film on the list that I did not like. Sure, Joaquin Phoenix did a great job here, but let's be honest, he's been much better in other roles. The music is kind of dope on its own, but paired with the actual film, it feels super out of place. Todd Phillips was going for a comic book movie that didn't feel like a comic book movie, and that's awesome in concept, but when you look at exactly what he did here, it was laughably ridiculous. Every person the Joker meets in this movie is an asshole to him for no reason, and the film tries to paint him as this victim of mental illness, but it's so unrealistic that it comes across as insensitive and immature. Technically speaking, the film is at least competent in its cinematography and editing, but it's its script that makes it such a struggle to watch without laughing. And as it turns out, Todd Phillips sure as hell wasn't intentionally making me laugh here. He said it himself, you can't be funny in today's woke culture. Well, if, if Joker had been an intentionally dark comedy, I think I would have actually enjoyed it. Instead, Todd Phillips was the clown the whole time. Number 8, 1917, directed by Sam Mendes, 10 nominations, 3 wins. 1917 follows a trek across no man's land in World War I as two young soldiers are given the order to stop a scheduled attack by morning time. This was an absolute treat to watch in theaters, as long as you can stay awake during those first 20 minutes. But after that, it's such an absolute treat to watch in theaters. Here we have a film that has been praised to death due to Roger Deakins' cinematography. And you know what? It completely deserves it. Some of the visuals in this film are absolutely breathtaking, and pairing that with its unconventional musical score, it's a really rewarding film for the experience alone. Where 1917 loses me though is its story. The entire film is made to look like it's done in one shot, and it's amazing when there's really interesting stuff happening on the screen, it's just not so amazing when it's just two dudes walking and talking for 10 minutes. All in all, I've never seen a film that so easily captivates the wonder and awe you get while playing a video game, and yet turns out there's no skip cutscene button here. Number 7, Ford vs Ferrari, directed by James Mangold, 5 nominations, 2 wins. Ford v Ferrari is a film about cars. It's a good film about cars, but like, it's about cars. I was personally impressed with the sound in this one. They used a real GT40 to record all of the car sounds in this film, and watching it in theaters made for some really dope moments sonically. All the racing scenes are shot beautifully, and I love the way they use the color and lighting. I enjoy the performances of Matt Damon and Kristen Bell. Their friendship throughout this film is a bit on the complicated side, but it's definitely a highlight for me. My main criticism though, after watching this twice, is its story. It's nothing bad, and as far as predictable stories go, I did enjoy it, but it's just that, predictable. If you want a good movie to throw on in the background for your grandpa while you hear some vroom vroom sounds, then Ford v Ferrari is perfect for that. Number 6, Jojo Rabbit, directed by Taika Waititi, 6 nominations, 1 win. Jojo Rabbit showcases the horror of World War II through a comedic lens, 
and I really loved it. It shares the story of a young German boy who finds out that his mother has been hiding a Jewish girl in the attic. This would be okay if it wasn't for the fact that he happens to be a Nazi fanatic. In the same year that Todd Phillips said that comedies about serious topics couldn't be done anymore, Taika Dunn went and dressed up like Hitler and ate unicorn meat. While comedy is definitely a strength in Jojo Rabbit through its absurdist parody moments, offbeat and creative editing, costumes and overall production design, it's the heart of the film that really brings it all together for me. The story itself is a bit on the predictable side compared to more of the higher films on this list, but I wouldn't discredit this script at all. It balances its humor and drama exceptionally well and ends on a message of hope, making it the most heartfelt and respectful story about World War II I've ever seen. Number 5, The Irishman, directed by Martin Scorsese, 10 nominations, 0 wins. The newest Martin Scorsese film gives us Frank, a World War II vet in a nursing home reminiscing on his days as a hitman in this 3.5 hour crime epic. The Irishman was quite a surprise to me. I've never seen a Scorsese film or any of the classic gangster films for that matter, so I didn't quite know what to expect here, but I ended up being entertained for the entire runtime. This film never really felt slow, every scene felt purposeful, and every new character felt important to the story. We get multiple decades worth of material here, and they're all building up these relationships between Frank, Russell, and Jimmy. In a genre that often glorifies violence and crime, each hit in The Irishman felt a lot more subdued, like it was part of a job that Frank just did. It brought a much more deeper level of character to Frank that I'm sure would be even more interesting on a rewatch. The performances of Al Pacino and Robert De Niro are classic. The minor yet important role of Frank's daughter Peggy impacts the film the more and more I think about it. And the editing is brilliantly natural, keeping the pacing near perfect. This is three and a half hours of pure cinema. Number four, Little Women, directed by Greta Gerwig, six nominations, one win. Little Women may seem like another adaptation of an old book, but instead it ends up being the definitive way to experience this classic story about transitioning from childhood to adulthood. Little Women essentially covers the same plot as the book, though it does so by using the medium of film to its advantage in a unique and creative way. Weaving between two different time periods, we follow the four March sisters as they grow up, pursue their dreams, and settle down for adulthood. Greta Gerwig takes these scenes and seamlessly transitions between the two time periods, using color grading and costumes to key the audience in on where in time they are at any given moment. One minute, Joe and Amy March are fighting as teenagers, and the next, they're a country away. Sequences seem to happen, but then they flow into the next one flawlessly in this dreamlike atmosphere, making this the happiest film of 2019 for me. And while I may not be a woman or someone who's about to get married, as someone who did just transition into adulthood not too long ago, I still heavily relate to a lot of the choices these characters have to make. Number three, Marriage Story, directed by Noah Baumbach, six nominations, one win. While the last one was happy, this one is basically the opposite. In fact, Marriage Story should actually be called Divorce Story. Thanks, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Very cool. Based off of his own messy divorce, Noah Baumbach carefully writes this nuanced look into the failing relationship of Charlie and Nicole Barber. While a lot of films on this list has impressive production design or sound editing, special effects, or clever cinematography, Marriage Story is a much more focused film that relies more on the writing, acting, and editing. Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver both bring a lot of depth to these characters as I constantly flip-flopped as to who was actually at fault here. The film chooses to give Scarlett Johansson a long monologue with little to no editing right before spending a big chunk of the film following a confused Adam Driver. I had empathy for both of them because as it turns out, they both did things that hurt the other person, whether they were intentional or not. I've never personally seen a divorce up close but I'm sure that this film would hit home for anyone that has witnessed one or been in one, but it does so in such a manner that it feels very intentional and respectful, making it the most bittersweet film on this list. Number two, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, directed by Quentin Tarantino, 10 nominations, two wins. The newest Tarantino film gives us an atmospheric 1969's Hollywood, following actor Rick Dalton and his stunt double and best friend Cliff Booth throughout a troubled spot in Rick's career. 
Much like Scorsese, I had never seen a Tarantino film until this year, and man, I really loved everything about this. The slow, slice of life paced opening, showcasing the close friendship that Rick and Cliff had, detailed by the amazing performances by Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt, the sounds and sights of Hollywood in the 60s through impeccable production design and immersive sound editing, the suspense and intrigue surrounding the utilization of the Manson family that builds into one of my favorite scenes from the past decade. This film acts as a modern day fairy tale as it fabricates and exaggerates real life events that happened in 1969, especially those surrounding the Manson family and the life of late actress Sharon Tate. Rather than turning her into a character, Tarantino uses Margot Robbie's role as a tribute to Sharon. While Once Upon a Time starts out as a slow, seemingly meandering story with very little plot, it turns into an unpredictable build up that's even more entertaining on rewatch with one of my favorite final acts of the year, and that's why it's all the way here at the top. Well, almost. We've still got one more film left. Number one, Parasite. Directed by Bong Joon-ho, six nominations, four wins. Parasite is a modern masterpiece. Acting as a commentary on class differences in South Korea, Parasite tells the story of a poor family who con their way into working with a rich family. Not only is there deeply layered metaphors surrounding the differences of class through its use of geography, set design, lighting, and color, but Parasite succeeds in getting these themes across while also being a thoroughly entertaining genre-infused trip. There's elements of heist films, horror movies, psychological thrillers, and more, all while also just being downright funny at times. Out of all the films on this list, this is the one I don't want to talk about too much simply because I'm afraid of spoiling literally anything. To be honest, I've already spoiled too much if you haven't seen it yet. There's a reason it won Best Picture this year. There's a reason Bong Joon-ho is now the only other man except for Walt Disney to win four Oscars in one night. And there's a reason I've now seen Parasite three times and I'll definitely be watching it again in the future. So with that, go watch Parasite as soon as you can. But that's it. That's all of the Best Picture nominees of 2020. I'm really happy with the films chosen this year. There's definitely some other films I would have preferred to be here instead of a couple of the other ones. But overall, this really wasn't a bad bunch of films and I'm glad that Parasite won Best Picture. I've been doing this for three years now and this has definitely been my favorite year so far. I'm looking forward to seeing what we have coming up next year, even though the, the Oscars are potentially gonna be postponed. And I'm actually gonna be going back to previous years that I haven't seen yet and doing ranking videos on those years. So let me know in the comments what years you would like to see first because I'm really interested in seeing what other movies have been nominated for this prestigious award in the past and hopefully I'll find some new favorite films in the process. Well, I guess I'm a sellout now. Today's episode of Your Everyday Nerd is brought to you by the merch. That's right, we have shirts, we have hats, we have hoodies. If you haven't checked them out yet, there's a link in the description. You can check them all out there. I really, really, really love this merch. This hat is really dope because it's got the, the cool design of the logo on there and it's like threaded in there and I just really love it. The shirt is super comfortable. I've ordered from a couple of merch stores in the past and this is my favorite material so far. It feels like it's actually gonna last a while instead of the design just kind of coming off in the washing machine because I know a lot of popular merch stores out there be doing that and it kind of sucks ass. But hopefully, if you guys haven't already and you want to support the channel, support the show, support me and what I do here, go check it out. And in doing so, you'll be supporting your everyday nerd. But that's all the time we have for today. If you liked the video, go hit that like button. If for a reason you didn't like it, hit that dislike button. Let me know down in the comments. What are your favorite films from this year's Best Picture nominees? Give me your personal ranking. I'm very interested in everybody else's opinions on this. Also, if you're new to the channel and you haven't yet subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. We're trying to hit a thousand subs before the end of the year and we're very, very close. I know we can do it. I know we can do it. So hit it up. In the meantime, thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time in the next episode of Your Everyday Nerd. Goodbye.